Well, it appears that the Supreme Court decision on Monday is starting us on a path away from the Constitution. Stick with me, folks, and I'll get to it all in just a minute. Hey, everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and wow, the Supreme Court on Monday is headed down a very slippery slope, and it's not towards the Constitution. And that's something that we really need to be aware of. Now, this is from the Babylon Bee. I just really enjoy their humor. Remember, Babylon Bee is a parody site, so uh, it is not news. Please don't promote it as news. But uh, sometimes they get really close to the mark, which is kind of why it's so funny. But no, no, the Supreme Court building just started sliding down a slippery slope at an incredible rate. I'm not so sure that's not true after reading the entire decision. Yeah, I did. I spent the whole day reading it. Well, the whole evening. And so uh, this is the actual article. They're not very long. They're never very long, but it came out on the 16th. And they have another one that's very similar (laughs) SCOTUS hopes no one realizes they lost their only copy of the Constitution. Oh, and if you'd read the entire opinion, that's probably what you're going to think. So, yeah. Oh, I just, oh, very frustrating. Now, for those of you who may not like to hear me babble on, because sometimes I do talk a little too much, I understand that. But I think I'm going to try to hit the high points of the different things in the actual document because you know me I like to go to the documents but if you just want a brief overview you're running short on time this would be a really good article to read from the National Review because it goes through and it gives a summary Alito really had the best dissent opinion not that Kavanaugh's wasn't good I think Alito's was more common language and I think you'd find it an easier read because he makes a lot of really good points Now, just in case you don't know, these are the justices in the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, and there are nine of them all together. Well, the ruling was six to three. I am extremely disappointed in that ruling, and I'm especially disappointed in this guy right here. This is Gorsuch. This was Trump's appointee. Yeah, I'm really disappointed in him because in the majority that voted for it, he's the one that ended up writing the opinion. And I'm going to tell you that in my opinion, his opinion is horribly put together. It's sad. There are holes big enough you could drive semis through it. And he keeps pointing out things that really are not pertinent to what's going on. And a couple of times I read it and it's like, I have no idea what that has to do with what we're talking about. (laughs) So just to remind you, this is Kavanaugh and this is Alito and this is Thomas. Those were the three that voted against this. The rest of them, this is Breyer and Gorsuch and Sotomayor and Roberts and Kagan and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And they all voted together, which these two are supposed to be conservatives, (laughs) supposed to be. And for the most part, Gorsuch has been, but, um, you know, Roberts, we know that he goes back and forth. I I don't know. I'm very discouraged by what happened. I just am. Anyway, this is the decision. This is the opinion of the court. And so what they had was they had three different cases that were brought before them and that petitioned for certiorari, which means that they would hear it. And they were about um, people being fired for being a homosexual or for being transgender. And so that is what this is here. It goes through, and at the very beginning, they always have all these different um, setting it all up. And so when it talks about the employer, it's talking about the people that fired these uh, three people. So... It just, they put them together because they felt like they all had the same basic thing at the heart of it, which was, how do you define sex? (laughs) Which is, you know, it's kind of like that Clinton thing, you know? Well, it depends on the definition of what is, is. Well, this is what sex is, evidently. And it's not what you think. It's different. So let me go down here. 
Uh, you got to go through all this. Okay, here is Gorsuch delivered the opinion of the court in which Roberts, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan joined, and then Alito filed a dissenting opinion in which Thomas joined. So uh, Thomas just kind of went along with Alito, and then Kavanaugh filed a dissenting opinion as well. They sometimes do that, sometimes they don't. It all depends on kind of how uh, fiery it's gotten, I think. Okay, let's get going here because this is the whole thing. And as you can see, these are the different people involved. One of them was a funeral home employee who was a man when they hired him. And then suddenly they sent him a letter saying, I've decided I'm going to be a woman. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. So yeah, and Gorsuch delivered the opinion of the court. So let's get going here. And he starts out and says, sometimes small gestures can have unexpected consequences. Major initiatives practically guarantee them. In our time, few pieces of federal legislation rank in significance with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There in Title VII, and you're going to hear about Title VII a lot, Congress outlawed discrimination in the workplace on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Today, we must decide whether an employer can fire someone simply for being homosexual or transgender. The answer is clear. Oh, no, it's not. Ugh. An employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. See, they start putting in these little digs and twisting things around, even here. Sex plays a necessary and undistinguishable role in the decision. Exactly what Title VII forbids. Now, this is where they make the mistake. This is the flaw in their basic foundation. Because they say that if you're going to discriminate against someone for sexual preference or for gender identity, then sex has to play a role in it. Their sex, whether they're male or female. That's not necessarily true. Because if you have a policy, say a church school has a policy that they do not hire homosexuals, whether they are male or female, makes no difference. That behavior is not allowed in one of their employees. So they're not discriminating on the basis of the person's sex, whether they are male or female. They're discriminating on something else. And this is where the fight happened in this. Because they're trying to say the majority opinion here that Gorsuch is writing says that, well, you know, that they're the same thing. They have to be the same thing. The thing is, when he's setting it up here, this is where he starts out. And you're going to have to pardon me because there's going to be a lot of jumps in here. I, You know, I figure you don't want to see me scrolling down or, you know, whatever. This court normally interprets a statute in accordance with the ordinary public meaning of its terms at the time of its enactment. That's key. That's how the Supreme Court is supposed to do things. That's how they normally do it. But they did not do that here. Oh, no. And he goes on and says, After all, only the words on the page constitute the law adopted by Congress and approved by the president. Yes, very true. If judges could add to, remodel, update, or detract from old statutory terms inspired only by extra-textual sources and our own imaginations, we would risk amending statutes outside the legislative process reserved for the people's representatives. In other words, Congress, the legislative branch. And we would deny the people the right to continue relying on the original meaning of the law they have counted on to settle their rights and obligations. Okay, I agree with him totally on this. But this is not what happens in the rest of his entire argument. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to say this up front, and then I'm going to totally ignore it as I go on. And so he goes on, well, you know, with this in mind, our task is clear. 
he uses the word clear a lot. We must determine the ordinary public meaning of Title VII's command that it is unlawful for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Okay. So they have to figure it out. To do so, we orient ourselves to the time of the statute's adoption here, 1964, and begin by examining the key statutory terms in turn before assessing their impact on the cases at hand and then confirming our work against this court's precedents. Okay, well, again, this is what they're supposed to do. This is not what they did in this case. Because in 1964, homosexuality was still considered a mental illness. Okay? And we're going to talk about that later. But anyway, yeah, it is mentioned, and I believe it was mentioned by, I think it was Kavanaugh. I, I don't remember. I do have it on the page, but, you know, I've got lots of notes here, and I'm trying to go through them all. So this is what they're supposed to be doing. Again, we're laying the foundation. This is how it's supposed to be done. But is that how it's going to be done? Oh, no, 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 no. Here's where it starts getting really weird. From the ordinary public meaning of the statute's language at the time of the law's adoption, a straightforward rule emerges. An employer violates Title VII when it intentionally fires an individual employee based in part on sex. Okay? It doesn't matter if other factors besides the plaintiff's sex contributed to the decision, and it doesn't matter if the employer treated women as a group the same when compared to men as a group. If the employer intentionally relies, in part, on an individual employee's sex when deciding to discharge the employee, put differently, if changing the employee's sex would have yielded a different choice by the employer, a statutory violation has occurred. Title VII's message is simple but momentous. An individual employee's sex is not relevant to the selection, evaluation, or compensation of employees. Okay? So, they say, well, this is the situation. It is fine. And then he goes on and says, the statute's message for our cases is equally simple and momentous. An individual's homosexuality or transgender status is not relevant to employment decisions. See, this does not follow with what he just said. This is not the same. It's not the same whether somebody is a homosexual or not. It has nothing to do with their biological sex. And that's where the problem comes in. They're redefining things. They're redefining what sex actually means, I think, here. It says, that's because it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. Again, a false foundation. That's what this all is based on right there. The false foundation. Because, you see, the problem is... If you have two people, one is a male and one is a female, and they are both homosexuals, then you're not discriminating on sex at all. You're discriminating on a behavior. You're not discriminating on the biological sex of that person. The text of Title VII is the biological sex. If you go back, like he was saying, you go back to 1964, that was clearly what was meant when they put it in there. Biological sex. Do they have two X chromosomes or an XY? That's what they meant. So now it's been hijacked again. This is how the left does it. I have no idea why Gorsuch joined in on this. And, um, you know, it bothers me that he did on this particular thing. And here he says, there is simply no escaping the role intent plays here, just as sex is necessarily a but for cause when an employer discriminates against homosexual or transgender employees. An employer who discriminates on these grounds inescapably intends to rely on sex, biological sex. Remember when it says that, it means biological sex. 
in its decision making. And see this again, faulty foundation. Imagine an employer who has a policy of, of firing any employee known to be homosexual. The employer hosts an office holiday party and invites employees to bring their spouses. A model employee arrives and introduces a manager to Susan, the employee's wife. Will that employee be fired? If the policy works as the employer intends, the answer depends entirely on whether the model employee is a man or a woman. To be sure, that employer's ultimate goal might be to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, but to achieve that purpose, the employer must, along the way, intentionally treat an employee worse based in part on that individual's sex. See what they're doing? This is how the entire argument went over and over and over again. And then he brought in stuff that had nothing to do with it. And I'm sitting there going, what? How's that fit in? It doesn't fit in at all. Lots of red herrings throughout this. And again, repeating the same flawed foundational premise. In this, it really, it's not a matter of whether the person is male or female, because you see, if they had somebody who was married to a spouse named Bob, then if it's a guy who's married to Bob, they're going to be fired. If it's a woman who's married to Susan, they're going to be fired. That's because it's not about their sex. It's not about their biological sex. It is about the whole thing having to do with whether an employer can or cannot say you're fired because you engage in a behavior that the employer finds not appropriate for an employee of their company. Okay, then we go on. So in this paragraph, he's talking about the employers, which would be the people that fired the, um, you know, people in question. In this last paragraph, the employer's argument proceeds in two stages. Seeking footing in the statutory text, they begin by advancing a number of reasons why discrimination on the basis of homosexuality or transgender status doesn't involve discrimination because of sex. But each of these arguments turns out only to repackage errors we've already seen and in this court's precedents have already rejected. It's been debunked because we say it's been debunked. Don't ask us why. We don't have to include that. We just need to tell you it's been debunked and you must believe us. Yeah, that's really what that one came across. Oh, just wonderful stuff that I'm finding here. What then do the employers mean when they insist intentional discrimination based on homosexuality or transgender status isn't intentional discrimination based on sex? Maybe the employers mean they don't intend to harm one sex or the other as a class. But as should be clear by now, the statute focuses on discrimination against individuals, not groups. Alternatively, the employers may mean that they don't perceive themselves as motivated by a desire to discriminate based on sex. But nothing in Title VII turns on the employer's labels or any further intentions or motivations for its conduct beyond sex discrimination. In Manhart, the employer intentionally required women to make higher pension contributions only to fulfill the further purpose of making things more equitable between men and women as groups. And that was because the women live longer than the guys, so they figured they'd have to pay more out to them in the pensions. So that's why they wanted the women to have to pay a little bit more. So it balanced things out. In Phillips, the employer may have perceived itself as discriminating based on motherhood, not sex, given that its hiring policies as a whole favored women. And in that one, it was that they were fine with men who had small children, but they wouldn't hire women with small children. So uh, that was what that one was. But in both cases, the court said all this aside is irrelevant. The employer's policies involved intentional discrimination because of sex and Title VII liability necessarily followed. Aren't these cases different, the employers ask, given that an employer could refuse to hire a gay or transgender individual without ever learning the applicant's sex? Suppose an employer asked homosexual or transgender applicants to tick a box on its application form. 
The employer then had someone else redact any information that could be used to discern sex. The resulting applications would disclose which individuals are homosexual or transgender without revealing whether they also happen to be men or women. Doesn't that possibility indicate that the employer's discrimination against homosexual or transgender persons cannot be sex discrimination? Yes, that is true. But he says, no, it doesn't. Yeah, I'm reading through this going, oh, how many times did I sit there and say, wait, that's not right. That's not right. If you don't know if they're male or female, you're not discriminating based on sex. You're discriminating based on whether they're homosexual or transgender. It's a different thing. It is not the same. And he goes through, he, he justifies it. I mean, he does handstands to try to get it justified. It's really crazy. Now, this raises a lot of concern for me because my first thought was, oh, what happens to religious institutions? And not even just that. What about, you know, maybe somebody who has an organization that uh, works with kids or that works with um, certain people and they don't want to have someone who is transgender or homosexual involved in that? I mean, it could be, and, and, you know, just for regular business rights, you really should be able to hire people that follow with your type of business ethics. So, you know, if you don't believe that homosexuality is right, then you shouldn't have to hire somebody who is to work in your company. And really, with all this that's coming through, this is my big fear here, is that this is what's going to happen, and then, uh, you know, they're there's not going to be any protection for any religious organization that wants to um, not hire homosexuals. It says here, separately, the employers fear that complying with Title VII's requirements in cases like ours may require some employers to violate their religious convictions. We are also deeply concerned with the preserving the promise of the free exercise of religion enshrined in our Constitution. That guarantee lies at the heart of our pluralistic society. But worries about how Title VII may intersect with religious liberties are nothing new. They even predate the statute's passage. As a result of its deliberations in adopting the law, Congress included an express statutory exception for religious organizations. This court has also recognized that the First Amendment can bar the application of employment discrimination laws quote, to claims concerning the employment relationship between a religious institution and its ministers. Okay, but that's just a religious institution and its ministers. Has nothing to do with anyone else who has any religious convictions. You know, a lot of us have religious convictions and we are not ministers. We're not uh, somebody working for a church. But that doesn't change it that we still have religious convictions. And Congress has gone a step further yet in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. That statute prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a person's exercise of religion unless it demonstrates doing so both furthers a compelling governmental interest and represents the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. Because the RFRA operates as a kind of super statute displacing the normal operation of other federal laws, it might, get the word there, might supersede Title VII's commands in appropriate classes. We don't know. And the, he admits right here that this is going to open a Pandora's box, but doesn't seem to bother him any. So then he goes on and he says, but how these doctrines protecting religious liberty and interact with Title VII are questions for future cases too. So, yeah, I know we're opening up that Pandora's box, but hey, we don't care. Harris Funeral Homes, which was the one that had the transgender person, did unsuccessfully pursue a, an RFRA-based defense in the proceedings below. In its certiorari petition, however, the company declined to seek review of that adverse decision, and no other religious liberty claim now is now before us. So while other employers in other cases may raise free exercise arguments that merit careful consideration, none of the employers before us today represent in this court that compliance with Title VII will infringe their own religious liberties in any way. Huh. Yeah. 
So we don't care. We don't care that that's going to happen down the road. Well, anyway, then he goes on. He says, some of those who support adding additional language to Title VII to ban sex discrimination may have hoped, and this is talking about originally, may have hoped it would derail the entire Civil Rights Act. Yet, contrary to those intentions, the bill became law. Since then, Title VII's effects have unfolded with far-reaching consequences, some likely beyond that what many in Congress or elsewhere expected. But none of this helps decide today's cases. Ours is a society of written laws. Judges are not free to overlook plain statutory commands on the strength of nothing more than suppositions about intentions or guesswork about expectations. In Title VII, Congress adopted broad language making it illegal for an employer to rely on an employee's sex when deciding to fire that employee. We do not hesitate to recognize today a necessary consequence of that legislative choice. An employer who fires an individual merely for being gay or transgender defies the law. No, because you just said you can't do that you've got to look at the plain statutory command and then he turns around and he says this it not it's not logical it does not follow you can't do that oh this is uh, sorry a little bit of a rant here but this is how i read the whole thing i was my cats got a little scared <laughs> they were wondering who i was yelling at but oh it just infuriated me to see this okay and then at this point we get to yes this is alito's opinion his dissenting opinion here and again justice thomas is joining him in this and here's what he says there is only one word for what the court has done today legislation the document that the court releases is in the form of a judicial opinion interpreting a statute, but that is deceptive. I mean, he pulls no punches in this. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employment discrimination on any of five specified grounds, race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Neither sexual orientation nor gender identity appears on that list. For the past 45 years, bills have been introduced in Congress to add sexual orientation to the list, and in recent years, bills have included gender identity as well. But to date, none has passed both houses. Last year, which means they're not law, okay? They're not law. Last year, the House of Representatives passed a bill that would amend Title VII by defining sex discrimination to include both sexual orientation and gender identity. But the bill has stalled in the Senate. An alternative bill, and that's H.R. 5331, would add similar prohibitions but contains provisions to protect religious liberty. This bill remains before a House subcommittee. Because no such amendment of Title VII has been enacted in accordance with the requirements in the Constitution, passage in both houses and presentment to the President, Title VII's prohibition of discrimination because of sex still means what it has always meant. But the court is not deterred by these constitutional niceties. Usurping the constitutional authority of other branches, the court has essentially taken H.R. 5's provision on employment discrimination and issued it under the guise of statutory interpretation. A more brazen abuse of our authority to interpret statutes is hard to recall. The court tries to convince readers that it is merely enforcing the terms of the statute, but that's preposterous. Even as understood today, the concept of discrimination because of sex is different from discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity. And in any event, our duty is to interpret statutory terms to mean what they conveyed to reasonable people at the time they were written. If every single living American had been surveyed in 1964, it would have been hard to find any who thought the discrimination because of sex meant discrimination because of sexual orientation. Not to mention gender identity, a concept that was essentially unknown at the time. The court attempts to pass off its decision as the inevitable product of the textualist school of statutory interpretation championed by our late colleague Justice Scalia. But no one should be fooled. The court's opinion is like a pirate ship. 
It sails under a textualist flag, but what it actually represents is a theory of statutory interpretation that Justice Scalia excoriated, the theory that courts should update old statutes so that they better reflect the current values of society. Yeah, Scalia was against that. You do not want them just deciding, well, you know what, that's out of date, so we're just going to change it and make it sound better and more up to date. Uh, the judicial system can't do that. They have no power to do that. If the court finds it appropriate to adopt this theory, it should own up to what it's doing. Many will applaud today's decision because they agree on policy grounds with the court's updating of Title VII. But the question in these cases is not whether discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity should be outlawed. The question is whether Congress did that in 1964. It indisputably did not. I told you, he goes through and he just lays it all out here. And here they define the specifically, you know, the definition of sex as in biological sex. And that's what it says in all the dictionaries. And, you know, he says down here, if that is so, it should be perfectly clear that Title VII does not reach discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity. If sex in Title VII means biologically male or female, then discrimination because of sex means discrimination because the person in question is biologically male or biologically female. Not because that person is sexually attracted to members of the same sex or identifies as a member of a particular gender. How then does the court claim to avoid that confusion? The court tries to cloud the issue by spending many pages discussing matters that are beside the point. Like I said, sometimes I read it and it's like, what in the world? That has nothing to do with this entire thing. The court observes that a Title VII plaintiff need not show that sex was the sole or primary motive for a challenged employment decision or its sole or primary cause, that Title VII is limited to discrimination with respect to a list of specified actions, such as hiring, firing, etc., and that Title VII protects individual rights, not group rights. All that is true, but so what? In cases like those before us, a plaintiff must show that sex was a motivating factor in the challenged employment action. So the question we must decide comes down to this. If an individual employee or applicant for employment shows that his or her sexual orientation or gender identity was a motivating factor in a hiring or discharge decision, for example, is that enough to establish that the employer discriminated because of sex? Or, to put the same question in different terms, if an employer takes an employment action solely because of the sexual orientation or gender identity of an employee or, it, or applicant, has that employer necessarily discriminated because of biological sex? The answers to those questions must be no. Unless discrimination because of sexual orientation or, or gender identity inherently constitutes discrimination because of sex. The court attempts to prove that point, and that's in Gorsuch's, I told you, that's kind of the basis of everything he says. And it argues not merely that the terms of Title VII can be interpreted that way, but that they cannot reasonably be interpreted any other way. According to the court, the text is unambiguous. The arrogance of this argument is breathtaking. As I will show, there is not a shred of evidence that any member of Congress interpreted the statutory text that way when Title VII was enacted. But the court apparently thinks that this was because the members were not smart enough to realize what its language means. The court seemingly has the same opinion about our colleagues on the Court of Appeals because until 2017, Every single court of appeals to consider the question interpreted Title VII's prohibition against sex discrimination to mean discrimination on the basis of biological sex. And for good measure, the court's conclusion that Title VII unambiguously reaches discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity necessarily means that the EEOC failed to see the obvious for the first 48 years after Title VII became law. Day in and day out, the commission enforced Title VII, but did not grasp what discrimination because of sex unambiguously means.
The court's argument is not only arrogant, it is wrong. It fails on its own terms. Sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity are different concepts as the court concedes. And when it says ante here, it means before, and that would be the page number. So it's talking about Gorsuch's um, opinion up before this. And neither sexual orientation nor gender identity is tied to either of the two biological sexes. And that's where Gorsuch said, recognizing that discrimination on these bases does not have some disparate impact on one sex or another. Both men and women may be attracted to members of the opposite sex, members of the same sex, or members of both sexes. And individuals who are born with the genes and organs of either biological sex may identify with a different gender. Using slightly different terms, the court asserts again and again that discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity inherently or necessarily entails discrimination because of sex, which I've said. That's what they kept saying over and over again. That's how you get people to, you know, believe things because you just keep repeating it over and over. But anyway, and that's what he says down here. But repetition of an assertion does not make it so. And the court's repeated assertion is demonstrably untrue. And those were all the different times that they said it. I mean, he said it several times. Contrary to the court's contention, discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity does not in and of itself entail discrimination because of sex. We can see this because it is quite possible for an employer to discriminate on those grounds without taking the sex of an individual applicant or employee into account. An employer can have a policy that says we do not hire gays, lesbians, or transgender individuals and an employer can implement this policy without paying any attention to or even knowing the biological sex of gay, lesbian, and transgender applicants. In fact, at the time of the enactment of Title VII, the United States military had a blanket policy of refusing to enlist gays or lesbians, and under this policy for years thereafter, applicants for enlistment were required to complete a form that asked whether they were homosexual. And then down here it says, it is curious to see this argument in an opinion that purports to apply the purest and highest form of textualism because the argument effectively amends the statutory text. Title VII prohibits discrimination because of sex itself, not everything that is related to, based on, or defined with reference to sex. Many things are related to sex. Think of all the nouns other than orientation that are commonly modified by the adjective sexual. Some examples yielded by a quick computer search are sexual harassment, sexual assault, sexual violence, sexual intercourse, and sexual content. Does the court really think that Title VII prohibits discrimination on all these grounds? Is it unlawful for an employer to refuse to hire an employee with a record of sexual harassment in prior jobs or a record of sexual assault or violence? To be fair, the court does not claim that Title VII prohibits discrimination because of everything that is related to sex. The court draws a distinction between things that are inextricably related and those that are related in some vague sense. Apparently, the court would draft onto Title VII some arbitrary line separating the things that are related closely enough and those that are not, and it would do this in the name of high contextualism. And then they talk about actually labeling, you know, that it puts a label on them, uh, and it says the court insists that its label is the right one. And that presumably is why it makes such a point of arguing that an employer cannot escape liability under Title VII by giving sex discrimination some other name. That is certainly true, but so is the opposite. Something that is not sex discrimination cannot be converted into sex discrimination by slapping on that label. So the court cannot prove its point simply by labeling the employer's objection as attraction to men. Rather, the court needs to show that its label is the correct one. And a labeling standoff would not help the court because that would mean that the bare text of Title VII does not unambiguously show that its interpretation is right. The court would have no justification for its stubborn refusal to look any further. As it turns out, however, there is no standoff. It can easily be shown that the employer's real objection is not attraction to men, but homosexual orientation. In an effort to prove its point, the court carefully includes in its example 
just two employees, a homosexual man and a heterosexual woman. But suppose we add two more individuals, a woman who is attracted to women and a man who is attracted to women. A large employer will likely have applicants and employees who fall into all four categories, and a small employer can potentially have all four as well. We now have the four exemplars listed below with the discharged employees crossed out. And here they are. So there are the four possibilities, and they said, okay, let's have the look at these four, and then you have two that are crossed out. Those are the ones that, let's say, got fired. The discharged employees have one thing in common. It is not biological sex, attraction to men, or attraction to women. It is attraction to members of their own sex, in a word, sexual orientation. And that, we can infer, is the employer's real motive. In sum, the court's textual arguments fail on their own terms. The court tries to prove that it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. But as has been shown, it is entirely possible for an employer to do just that. Homosexuality and transgender status are distinct concepts from sex. That's what Gorsuch said in his opinion. And discrimination because of sexual orientation or transgender status does not inherently or necessarily constitute discrimination because of sex. The court's arguments are squarely contrary to the statutory text. But even if the words of Title VII did not definitively refute the court's interpretation, that would not justify the court's refusal to consider alternative interpretations. The court's excuse for ignoring everything other than the bare statutory text is that the text is unambiguous and therefore no one can reasonably interpret the text in any way other than the court does. Unless the court has met that high standard, has no justification for its blinkered approach. And to say that the court's interpretation is the only possible reading is indefensible. Kind of sounds like the liberals out there, doesn't it? You know, it, it is totally one way and obvious to everyone, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of like with YouTube's terms when I'm getting monetized or not. Because they put down terms that are not defined and how am I supposed to know what they're thinking? And they make it sound like this is not something you can even question. Like they have a whole list of things that are controversial subjects, so you can't, you can't present those without being demonetized. This is one of them, by the way. So yeah, this one will be demonetized. But how is child abuse controversial? I gotta ask, how is child abuse controversial? Is there anyone who thinks it's okay? That's not controversial. Controversy means that there are different, differing opinions on it. Legitimate differing opinions. And I just don't see child abuse being that way. I think it should enrage every human being. And those it doesn't, they're pretty pervy. And really we shouldn't bow to them. But I don't know why. I don't know why it is that that's considered controversial. And the other list that you can see here. So, I'm sorry. I digress. And he goes on and says, That brings us to the two remaining subsidiary definitions, both of which may refer to sexual urges or instincts and their manifestations. And then he gives the definition again here. The sexual urge or instinct as it manifests itself in behavior. And then down here, since both of these come after three prior definitions that refer to men and women, they are most naturally read to have the same association. And in any event, is it plausible that Title VII prohibits discrimination based on any sexual urge or instinct and its manifestations, the urge to rape? I was thinking, you know, the urge to abuse children. I mean there's a lot of pretty perverted stuff. Does it mean that you cannot, as an employer, and you find out that your one of your employees is sleeping with animals, you cannot fire them for that perverted behavior? See, it when you start doing this, it is a slippery slope, like the Babylon Bee said. It just slides right on down. And you got to be very careful about this. Because you are opening up the door for any sexual urge to be included in that. And that's scary. And then here's where it talks about the homosexuality. For most 21st century Americans, it's painful 
to be reminded of the way our society once treated gays and lesbians, but any honest effort to understand what the terms of Title VII were understood to mean when enacted must take into account the societal norms of that time. And the plain truth is that in 1964, homosexuality was thought to be a mental disorder, and homosexual conduct was regarded as morally culpable and worthy of punishment. In its then most recent Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1952, and that's the DSM-1, the American Psychiatric Association classified same-sex attraction as a sexual deviation, a particular type of sociopathic personality disturbance. And the next edition is issued in 1968, similarly classified homosexualities as sexual deviation. And just a word about this, the DSM, you know, the DSM really is kind of deceptive because it it comes across, it presents itself as something that is science-based. It's not. How they decide what goes into it and what the criteria and everything is, is pretty much a popular vote. So uh, it's not like if you get the measles or you get the coronavirus, there's medical proof that you have it. You know, you can take a blood test and you can find out. But, oh no, not with this. With mental illnesses, they just say, yeah, you think that should be a mental illness? Yeah, I think it should. Or like with homosexuality, you know what? I don't think that should be a mental illness anymore. And see, that's what happens. And that's a slippery slope as well. And a lot of people don't understand that, but it is very true. So just be aware that that's how the DSM, when people talk about it, it's how the DSM is. It's really not a science when they get into that kind of stuff. It is opinion. It's very much opinion based. But anyway, of course, you know, society's treatment of homosexuality and homosexual conduct was consistent with this understanding. Sodomy was a crime in every state but Illinois. This is what it was like in that time period. Now, whether you believe that's what it should be now or not makes no difference. That's what it was when this law was enacted and it has not been updated in any way by Congress and Congress makes the law. Now, Alito here at this point starts pointing out some of the really big considerations, the Pandora's box, as it were, that is being opened right now. And that's, you know, the whole thing about the bathrooms, locker rooms, and so forth. The court may wish to avoid this subject, but it is a matter of concern to many people who are reticent about disrobing or using toilet facilities in the presence of individuals whom they regard as members of the opposite sex. And uh, he mentions down here, for women who have been victimized by sexual assault or abuse, the experience of seeing an unclothed person with the anatomy of a male in a confined and sensitive location, such as a bathroom or a locker room, can cause serious psychological harm. And that's something to be taken into consideration. And then he goes on, then he mentions women's sports, because that's something too. I, you know, this really does open up a huge door and it, it's not right. It was not decided right. Alito and Thomas and Kavanaugh have it right. That's how it should have been decided according to our legal system. Housing is an issue that it could cause a problem with that. Employment right, religious organizations. You can just see these are all things that could may be major problems, you know, this problem is perhaps most acute when it comes to the employment of teachers. A school standards for its faculty communicate a particular way of life to its students and a violation by the faculty of those precepts may undermine the school's moral teaching. Thus, if a religious school teaches that sex outside of marriage and sex reassignment procedures are immoral, the message may be lost if the school employs a teacher who is in a same-sex relationship or who has undergone or is undergoing sex reassignment. So that's going to be something that's a problem there too. I tell you, it's really going to be crazy. And Gorsuch did us a disservice by really talking this down and ignoring it and kind of minimizing what the problems might be. Healthcare, that's going to be another part of it, you know. And then you've got down here freedom of speech because, you know, the whole thing about do you have to use the personal, the proper personal pronouns for those people. I'd be hard pressed as a teacher 
I tell you, if I were still teaching, I'm sorry. If you are biologically a boy, I'm going to call you he. If you're biologically a girl, I'm going to call you she. And I probably would be in a, in a lawsuit because of that. Constitutional claims, finally, despite the important differences between the 14th Amendment and Title VII, the court's decision may exert a gravitational pull in constitutional cases. Under our precedents, the Equal Protection Clause prohibits sex-based discrimination unless a heightened standard of review is met. By equating discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity with discrimination because of sex, the court's decision will be cited as a ground for subjecting all three forms of discrimination to the same exacting standard of review. Under this logic, today's decision may have effects that extend well beyond the domain of federal anti-discrimination statutes. This potential is illustrated by pending and recent lower court cases in which transgender individuals have challenged a variety of federal, state, and local laws and policies on constitutional grounds. So there's a lot to it that's going to be in effect, and that's something that we do need to take into consideration. And this is his closing statement. The updating desire to which the court succumbs no doubt arises from humane and generous impulses. Today, many Americans know individuals who are gay, lesbian, or transgender and want them to be treated with the dignity, consideration, and fairness that everyone deserves. But the authority of this court is limited to saying what the law is. The court itself recognizes this. And this was Gorsuch, this was in his uh, opinion. The place to make new legislation lies in Congress. When it comes to statutory interpretation, our role is limited to applying the law's demands as faithfully as we can in the cases that come before us. It is easy to utter such words. If only the court would live by them. I respectfully dissent. Now, Alito included a whole big bunch of stuff as like an appendix. I mean, charts and all kinds of stuff there. So um, you have to skip over several pages. This is Kavanaugh's opinion, and it doesn't start until page 145. So his dissenting opinion. And, of course, he restates the case here. I like what he says here. If judges could rewrite laws based on their own policy views or based on their own assessments of likely future legislative action, the critical distinction between legislative authority and judicial authority that undergirds the Constitution's separation of powers would collapse, thereby threatening the impartial rule of law and individual liberty. As James Madison stated, were the power of judging joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would be exposed to arbitrary control, for the judge would then be the legislator. I mean, you got to consider that. And that's really what's been happening with a lot of these liberal courts, especially. They've been legislating from the bench. And it's sad to say, but it looks to me like now our Supreme Court's doing the same thing. If judges could, for example, rewrite or update securities laws or health care laws or gun laws or environmental laws simply based on their own policy views, the judiciary would become a democratically illegitimate super legislature, unelected and hijacking the important policy decisions reserved by the Constitution to the people's elected representatives. Oh, he nailed it there, that's for sure. And this is kind of near the end of it. He says, I have the greatest and unyielding respect for my colleagues and for their good faith. But when this court usurps the role of Congress, as it does today, the public understandably becomes confused about who the policymakers really are in our system of separated powers and inevitably becomes cynical about the oft repeated aspiration that judges base their decisions on law rather than on personal preference. The best way for judges to demonstrate that we are deciding cases based on the ordinary meaning of the law is to walk the walk, even in the hard cases when we might prefer a different policy outcome. And then here he says, it is true that meaningful legislative action takes time, often too much time, especially in the unwieldy morass on Capitol Hill. I like this, but the Constitution does not put the legislative branch in the quote, position of a television quiz show contestant so that when a given period of time has elapsed and a problem remains unsolved by them, the federal judiciary may press a buzzer and take its turn at fashioning a solution. That was by Rehnquist. Oh, that was pretty good. 
the proper role of the judiciary in statutory interpretation cases is, quote, to apply, not amend, the work of the people's representatives, even when the judges might think that, quote, Congress should re-enter the field and alter the judgments it made in the past. And then he says, instead of a hard-earned victory won through the democratic process, today's victory is brought about by judicial dictate, judges latching on to a novel form of living literalism to rewrite ordinary meaning and remake American law. Under the Constitution and laws of the United States, this court is the wrong body to change American law in that way. The court's ruling, quote, comes at a great cost to representative self-government. And the implications of this court's usurpation of the legislative process will likely reverberate in unpredictable ways for years to come. So I think he did a good job with that. It was, uh, you know, the whole thing, they had really good rebuttals. I don't think that the majority ruled correctly in this at all. They legislated from the bench, and that's the wrong thing to do. Franklin Graham weighed in on this. If you want to read them, this was his first one. On Monday, the U.S. Supreme Court enacted a new law that adds sexual orientation and gender identity to the 1964 Civil Rights Act as protected classes. Justice Alito pointed out that the majority went too far. He called it a brazen abuse of our authority. And you'll notice he says, I mean, they're enacted and the Supreme Court can't do that. The Supreme Court usurped Congress in this case. Making laws is the job of our representatives in Congress elected by the people. This decision erodes religious freedoms across the country. People of sincere faith who stand on God's word as their foundation for life should never be forced by the government to compromise their religious beliefs. As a Bible-believing follower of Jesus Christ, my rights should be protected. Even if my sincerely held religious beliefs might be the minority, I still have a right to hold them. The Supreme Court does not override and will never overturn the Word of God. One day we will all have to stand before God, the righteous judge, whose decisions are not based on politics or the whims of culture. His laws are true and are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's what I've got for you. Sorry that this is turning out a little long, but you know, I just felt it was really important to go through that. I want to thank you for stopping by, and I'll see you all later.